I don't think I've ever had a mission that people have asked me to look into more than the life mission, a interferometry mission proposed to the European Space Agency to search for habitable exoplanets around other sun-like stars. Okay, fine. I cave to the pressure. You can tell me what to do. And so my guest today is uh, Dr. Daniel Angerhausen. He is the team lead for the LIFE mission. He is an astrophysicist, an astrobiologist, and has been working with NASA and many other agencies over a long career and is now working on proposing the LIFE mission. And this would be a multiple spacecraft flying in formation that are using interferometry and the and the nulling technique to be able to block the light of the star to reveal the planets and to characterize them detecting various kinds of chemicals in the atmospheres of those planets and maybe even technological chemicals in those planets so this would be one of the best shots ever proposed to directly image Earth-sized worlds orbiting around sun-like stars in the habitable zone and determine what chemicals are in the atmospheres of those planets. It's a fascinating concept. Great conversation with Daniel. I think you're really going to enjoy it. So enjoy this interview with Dr. Daniel Ungerhausen. So did you go through the whole rise of the uh, habitable planet finder mission, sort of when it was first announced and then got canceled by NASA back at the turn of the century? Did you kind of go through that rise and fall? Um, that was right like, at the time when I started my career. So I, I actually was for a year at JPL at this time, where it was quite a big hot, hot topic there. And also in, in Europe at the same time as the Darwin mission, there were actually kind of two right. approaches in this in this direction. So uh, and and now about 20 years later it's it's one of the things that i like the most actually about the life mission is that we are kind of like passing the torch from from the amazing work that all these you know now more senior colleagues did 20 years ago and we are trying to you know get, work on all the stuff that they prepared and then bring it to the next generation of astronomers so I'm i mean right there was also the sim yeah. mission as well mm -hmm. the space interferometry mm -hmm. mission and mm -hmm. that got canceled as well and that mm -hmm. was sort of like a, a simpler version mm -hmm. of the terrestrial mm -hmm. planet finder and and like no space-based interferometer has been really proposed i mean i guess there's lisa but do you think it was like too aggressive an idea at the time mm -hmm. so i think for tpfi and darwin they were just too early so yeah i mean besides like some technology developments that obviously happened in the last 20 years i think the main problem for them or one of the big problems was that it was before kepler so we really had no idea about planet's occurrence rates and then it's very hard for funding agencies for space agencies to to go forward with missions if you don't even have a good grasp of how many targets would would you know would there be for a mission like this and now that we at least roughly know how many earth like planets there are around you know main sequence stars in our neighborhood then you know we can we can start to extrapolate how many we would actually uh, be able to observe and that is also, one of the things that convinced me to to go into life once I saw the first paper that calculated the yield of how many uh, potentially habitable planets we would be able to characterize that that's really I think one of the biggest advances we made since then in in exoplanet science. Yeah. What's that estimate? What is sort of like the current estimate for the number of of Earth like worlds around us? I mean, there's a bunch of uh, a bunch of references for that, and it's. It's still a pretty pretty wide number, but it's I would say something between five percent and twenty five percent to really go from the the upper the minimum to the maximum. So so maybe a good estimate is always you know rule of thumb ten percent maybe, but it's still it's still a very uh, uh, unconstrained number because Kepler unfortunately didn't get us so deep into uh, Earth like planets. But but ten percent of sun like stars could have a plan a terrestrial planet in the habitable zone yeah something in this order of magnitude let it be five and wow. be 20 you know and then m stars uh earlier type star uh, later type stars probably even uh, a few more because there we have a somewhat better statistics but then there's all other kind of worms if they are habitable and how to make life on them and so on yeah but there's a decent number so from these yield studies that we did for life we are 
uh, pretty confident that we get at least a dozen of Earth twins in, in, in uh, quotation marks and a bunch of, let's say, 50 to maybe even 100, depending on the architecture of habitable zone, rocky planets, depending on, again, how you define the habitable zone and where you start, uh, you know, on the lower and upper radius limit for rocky planets, but somewhere in this ballpark. Yeah. That, it's funny, like when I, I play space exploration games where you're, you're building these galactic empires mm -hmm. and that sounds like we got the number kind of right when you think about like all of the stars that are around you and like a lot of them have worlds that are uninhabitable that every now and then there's a terrestrial world over there and you set up a colony over there and it, it feels like that that number is about like like if there is 10 percent, then there are stars within 20 light years of us 10 light years of us that have probably a terrestrial planet in the habitable zone yeah, that's exactly the calculation we made. And and by the way, I'm also playing a lot of these games. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's maybe a topic for another time. So yeah, so this is essentially, so, so for this life, we will probably be looking within the next 20, 30 parsec maybe. And and that's where these yeah. numbers come from. So if, if you go farther away, it's first of all, the, the planets get closer and closer to their star. And then eventually you just don't get any photons anymore from these, from these tiny planets, right? So. So let's talk about the life mission. Where mm -hmm. did the idea originate? Was it was it sort of like an idea of like a new way to do? I'll, I'll just ask a question. Where did the idea originate? <laughs> um, I think the first one of the first papers that we always cite is I think seventy six Nature paper by Bracewell, um, a very uh, very famous paper for interferometry. Where the first concept of having two telescopes and you take the light from one telescope to cancel out the light from the other one and then separate the planet in that way. So that was seventy six, and then uh, as we already talked about Darwin uh, and and TPFI as the concepts, you know, in the early two thousands um, that was uh, proposed at that time, and then really. Um, Sasha Kwanz, the, the current PI of, of life, uh, just picked it up about five, six years ago and started with this calculation, right? How many would we get? And then uh, he, he found out together with Jens Kamera, one of our, part of our team, that there will be these dozens, maybe even hundreds of planets that we could characterize. And then from, from there, we started with, with life. So that was, as I mentioned, something that convinced me and a bunch of others in the community that this is at least one of the missions we need if we really want to do this comparative exobiology or whatever you want to call it in, in the next 20 years. I'm always saying before I get retired, right? So this right. is really the shot that we have in our generation. Yeah. Now that concept that Bracewell proposed, this nulling, mm -hmm. this is using two telescopes separated where you're imaging the, tel the, the target simultaneously and then you're able to then cancel out the starlight and reveal the planets around that. And I guess that's different from, say, a coronagraph that there is on board JWST or maybe even flying a separate sunshade. It's a different technique. You get the benefit of the interferometer and you get the additional benefit of that nulling to cancel out the starlight. How effective is nulling, interferometric nulling, compared to some of the other ideas for coronagraphs? Mm -hmm. So it, it depends a bit, first of all, the wavelengths you're going to. So we are operating in the mid infrared with, with life. And there it's first of all a question of angular separation, right? So you can't build, so because you need to separate first of all the planet from the star, then you need baselines or radii, diameters of telescopes that are lambda over D probably is a, a familiar term from, for many, uh, uh, people who are viewing. So this is the first thing. So first of all, it's an angular resolution problem because you have to, you know, spatially separate the star. And then it's also a sensitivity problem. So, so these, these planets in the mid infrared, for example, there's always this rule of thumb, uh, an Earth like planet at, at 10 parsec sends like one photon per second per square meter per micron. So you can really, uh, as one of our colleagues always said, really give every photon a single name. So, so I think these are the, the, the two big challenges. The ones on one side, the, 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 you have to separate or somehow cancel the light of the, of the star. And then you still have to count these very few, um, photons you get from the planet. And there, this interferometry comes into play because it, at least in the infrared, you get these baselines, hundreds of meters to really get the spatial resolution and then, you have to add, you know, area in these four, in our case, telescopes to really collect the photons in a reasonable amount of time. Yeah. So, so let's talk about like the the actual telescope mission. You're proposing four 
telescopes? What would they what would they look like in sort of size? Yeah, so this is our current, you know, as we saw, as we call it baseline scenario. So so the yeah, we are still in the very early design phase. So we also have uh, papers by colleagues that that uh, discuss if, what if if we have three, what if we have five, what if we you know make a rectangle or a or a circle and, and different different base of it. But uh, in principle, it's it's four uh, collector telescopes. So they really collect the light and then uh, uh, reflect it, either directly reflect it. So even without any uh, secondary mirror, that is one idea into a combiner spacecraft where then the four beams from the collector uh, telescopes will be uh, in some way combined and then uh, uh, analyzed, uh, going to interfere and then get us these interferograms, which in the end are the measurement we are making. Yeah. And so you're going to so you're going to do this interferometry in real time, like similar to say the the way the very large telescope operates for, at the um, European Southern Observatory. Um, yes. So so, um, so so we are doing it in real time, but we are doing nulling interferometry. Right? So there are only very few uh, uh, observations yet with actual nulling from the ground. So interferometry, also like ALMA does, and many many radio telescopes do. They usually do. Uh, 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 additive interferometry. So they really just take the, the, the light from all telescopes and put them together. In our case, you have to make sure that we get this shift of half a wavelength between the, the different apertures to really make the light uh, cancel, cancel each other out. And then it's also a, a time series observation. So we essentially, by having these four telescopes, we essentially uh, project some sort of a transmission map on the sky. And then we rotate our telescope array and then the planet is moving through this in the case of four telescopes it almost looks like a chessboard you know you have like a transmission and non-transmission squares and then the planet moves through these squares and then you get these up and down uh, um, contributions from the planet going through this transmission map and then uh, it takes maybe a day depending on how long you observe to really rotate this area of four telescopes and then you get this time series observation from where you can then uh, derive where the planet is what the spectrum is and so on very complicated <laughs> is it does sound very complicated yeah. and it does sound very different right like i'm sort of envisioning these these four telescopes flying in formation they have their primary mirrors they're then focusing the light from their primary mirrors to some collection spacecraft how far away would the spacecraft be from the from the, the telescopes um so so at the moment we are working with a uh it's a baseline scenario where the uh, collector telescopes change can can change, so they also can change the baseline between uh, 100 and 600 meters, roughly. But there's there's not really a, a, a large limit uh, given. It's just what we are working with, and then you know depending on you know the optical uh, uh, pathways and stuff like this, it's probably on the similar order where where we would position the uh, the, the the beam combiner uh, spacecraft and. And this is really something that, that fascinates me with this life. It's, it's so many different parts, the formation flying, the interferometry, the sensitivity. So it's really so many technical challenges that, that we have. So it's, I mean, it's not easy, but this is why we are doing it, right? So. Oh, and I'm sure the, the people who are approving missions and thinking about technical risk uh, are nervous about all of these sort of new things that have to be developed. I mean, I think about what happened with with James Webb. I mean, there was <laughs> all of this new stuff that had to be developed, both in terms of the instruments, as well as the deployment of the telescope, and that technical debt kind of mounted up and we saw a longer timeline and a vastly bigger budget. And that is, of course, the the downside. I'm sure someone from the European Space Agency is just saying like, Ooh, that's a lot to take on with one mission. Um, but but and so this idea, I want to sort of explore this idea a bit more, just like you are creating this grid, you are nulling the light of the stars through pushing the the stars are essentially nudging one half wavelength off from each other. And that makes the star go away. But how do you then keep the planet? Exactly. So because so it's a bit like a. a, a I always compare it to the double slit experiment that maybe some still remember from school. And there's there's mostly uh, because it's uh, it's additive interferometry, right? You get this pattern of you know uh, increased signal and 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 no signal. And in our case, we take in, in, for example in the in the basic case of the Sprayfell of two uh, of two telescopes, 
you take the, the light coming from one telescope, shift it, you know, this is some engineering magic that happens, you shift it by half a wavelength, and then, you know, the waves are, uh, are exactly opposite of each other. And everything that's on axis, like the star, if you really point to the star, the, the light of the star cancels itself out. And everything that's off axis, like a planet, um, does, doesn't get uh, uh, this, inter this, this uh, uh, destructive interference. But that also means that, that other things in the, in, the, uh, in the system could still hurt us, like ex exozodical light, if there's, you know, an asteroid belt in the other systems, especially if they are uh, rotationally symmetric, then this becomes a noise source for us because this stuff doesn't disappear because it's not on axis, right? So, so this is also part of the calculations we are doing right now, what the influence of, of these kinds of additional signals would be. How big would these primary mirrors be on each of these spacecraft? So right now, again, with our baseline uh, scenario, we are talking about a uh, two meter individual collector wow. spacecraft. So something in the order of, uh, you know, what even slightly, slightly bigger than, than Hubble. But we also do scenarios where we work with three and a half, which is kind of like the Herschel, Herschel size in, in the infrared. Um, and, and also it's important to say that we are also then uh, calculating with the throughput of 5%, which is relatively uh, pessimistic. So it's always not just the, the, the size of the telescope, but also how much of the photons you actually get at the end. And this is the number we are working on, uh, working with right now. But we also did, you know, the whole calculation of the yield, for example, with this uh, three and a half meters. And then we get, you know, three times the planet and... If we do this characterization observations, we, you know, we can characterize an Earth at 10 parsec in 10 days instead of 100 days. So, and in the end, I mean, as always with telescopes, it, it scales with the size. But right now we are working with, you know, baseline of two meter at 5% throughput. And, in, in, you know, in our dream mission would be then three and a half, maybe. Yeah. Right. Or 10 meter. Yeah. Would be all right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, if the, if the system proves that it works. I mean, could you scale down and do a longer observation to still get that data? Like what is the smallest possible telescope size that would that would get you a positive result on maybe mm -hmm. one planet? Mm -hmm. um, there's actually work, I don't really know the, the, the exact numbers, but there's, there's work by colleagues from Belgium, for example, who looked into some sort of precursor missions, how you can do interferometry with maybe two CubeSats just to, to, to uh, simulate the measuring principle in, in space, or maybe oh, there's something on a, on a beam or something. And um, I'm, again, I'm not really super exact, uh, surely about the numbers, but I think you can at least build something that should be able to look at Proxima or, you know, the closest three parsec or something like that. I mean, there are some, some very well-known exoplanetary systems that can be seen with direct imaging that people have been watching for 20 years. And so if you could confirm that, like whatever is the minimum space telescope that could confirm the existence mm -hmm. of those planets, that would get you on the right footing. And as you say, it, you know, some CubeSats would be fascinating. It's such a powerful technique. Yeah. Yeah, so there's a lot of work. I mean, uh, in the lab also, so one, one thing that we are doing right now at ETH in Zurich is really, uh, first of all, showing that this works in the lab, right, under cold conditions, because we're doing it in the infrared. So the whole optics have to be cryogenic, which is probably also the first time that people tried this. There's a bunch of experiments doing it at room temperature, but doing it really under cryogenic conditions is, is a new thing. This is one of the key technologies that we're currently uh, um, currently uh, uh, demonstrating, but then there's also colleagues who are already doing it with, you know, shorter wavelength telescope from the ground right now. So prove that this nulling actually works with a ground based telescopes. So yeah, there's a lot going on in this, in this area. So I, I'd be surprised if, you know, uh, if not one day, this will be also a valid technique like the others. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it's back to the need for an interferometer. Like, like it's a complete, like up until this point, James Webb is like the largest possible telescope that you could launch that would fit within a five meter rocket fairing. Like that's it. Like anything bigger, you need a bigger rocket or you need to start building these things in space. But you launch small telescopes with a larger baseline, you get an interferometer, a whole different class of observations open up. It's just getting an infrared or an optical interferometer to actually function in space. And that is a challenge for sure. Um, so I guess what are what you know, what do you perceive to be the greatest cha challenges right now? What is the largest unknown in this process? 
So just from listening to the engineers and the instrument scientists, so I'm, I'm coming more from the observational side. So uh, for me, it's just whatever the signal is I, I get at the end, I, I work with. But I think from what I read and what I learned, probably the sensitivity is going to be the biggest problem. So this, this formation flying, there are a bunch of other missions already demonstrating is also neat in very many other aspects of, of space technology at the moment that needs formation flying. So that's probably going to be solved. Um, this whole cryogenic instruments, you know, uh, James Webb is already working with that uh, in the uh, also in the same wavelength uh, range in the mid infrared. But then it really comes essentially at the end down to these, you know, one photon per micron per square meter <laughs> per per second, right? So then you really need detectors that can count these uh, very efficiently. And I think this is right now probably the the biggest technological challenge to build detectors, also because it usually doesn't there are not really any commercial applications of super sensitive detectors in the mid infrared. There's been many uh, applications for mid infrared detectors, but usually you have very bright sources you, you pointed on. And so this is probably going to be one of the main challenges to develop these detectors to be sensitive enough for these super, super tiny lights that we get from the from these exoplanets. Yeah. So let's say everything goes great. The engineering challenges are worked out. The ESA stamps approval on launching this thing and at some point in I don't know next week the telescope launches and you've got data coming back so what would astronomers be able to do with the observations coming from the life mission mm -hmm. so Right now, we are planning with two phases for the live mission. So the first would be a detection phase where we kind of like scan our neighborhood, typically like a survey, go from star to star from a target list and first of all, find the targets. But this is really just assuming that in 20 years, there's still you know, not enough known for us. So this is kind of like a backup plan or to show that we are self-sufficient. We are not depending on any other mission to produce the targets for us. But if they are there in 20 years, fine, then we can directly go to this characterization phase. And then in this characterization phase, we already uh, did a couple of uh, papers, uh, some sort of sanity check. So the first was um, a paper by Bjorn Konrad and also uh, Eleonora Alley. They, they uh, worked on observing an Earth twin at 10 parsec. So this is usually one of the first tests you make, would we even be able to identify ourselves if we are at 10 parsec. So they modeled an Earth twin at 10 parsec and were able to find methane, to find oxygen, so all these uh, CO2, uh, water, all these molecules that we're interested in. So that was the first test. And now we are currently working on a bunch of other, you know, so-called potential cap, uh, potential biosignature uh, molecules, phosphine, uh, N2O, methylated halogen. So this is the stuff that we are currently working on. So this should all be possible. And then there's a bunch of signs that we can actually do and planets that we find that are not really habitable, but it's probably also super interesting for planetary science. A lot of stuff we can do for Venuses. With life, we are also relatively exclusive on uh, planets around M stars, which is a big topic uh, at the moment. So, yeah, there's a plethora of science we can do beyond just the search for life, search for habitability. Now, does it make sense to break those larger tasks into two pieces? Like the one you talked about, about being self-sufficient and finding targets like Kepler was going to be the target finding spacecraft. It was designed to find that other Earth sized world orbiting around a sun like star. And unfortunately, his reaction wheels failed and they had to change the mission. And so they were able to find lots of of planets around M dwarf stars, but they weren't able to find that other Earth. And Tess is finding a lot of planets in our neighborhood. But it's, you know, it's a it's a low power mission, like it's, it's amazing for what it for what it is, but it's not as a flagship in the way that, that Kepler was. It feels like we're at this point now where we need a direct imaging survey mission to find them all. And, and then separately, a mission that is more to characterize individual exoplanets and, and learn all you can from those. Are those, are those ideally two different kinds of missions? So I think one thing that we need to discuss here is that uh, all these things like Kepler tests that you mentioned are transit missions. So I'm, I'm personally coming from transit. I spent like half of my career doing transit, transit follow-up, uh, eclipse observations. And they are by design 
not uh, complete, right? So for every planet that you find in transit, there's 99 that you can't see just because they're not transiting, right? And, you know, there are certain calculations you can make that TRAPPIST, the TRAPPIST system, which is like super, uh, uh, the, the best golden target for James Webb by now is probably the best we can get. Maybe there's a few other systems like that, but there's not going to be a, a, a huge target list of transiting Earth-like planets. And then even if you get one, you know, think about if, if you found a transiting Earth, it would only transit once a year, right? And if you need to uh, add 50 transits, to get your signal, and then you're observing for 50 years, right? So transits was a great technique for getting the statistics, for doing these first kinds of observations. There's also Ariel coming up for, you know, hotter planets and bigger planets to do this transit and eclipse photometry, phase curves maybe. But then really, if you want to scan our neighborhood for all these non-transiting close-by systems, which you need close-by because the photons are not getting to you if you go too far away, then you really have to find direct imaging or go to direct imaging. And there might be, you know, extremely precise RV methods that might get us some targets, but to really find it, you need to, to find them all. You need direct imaging. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I guess, like, I agree that direct imaging is the way, as you said, you know, only 1% of planets are, are passing in front that you don't catch. You know, the analogy that I always like to use is like, say you go out at night, and you're trying to find airplanes, but you can only find mm -hmm. them when they pass in front of the moon, mm -hmm. right? You don't find <laughs> yeah. a lot of airplanes. Yeah. You go out yeah. in the day and you look across the entire sky and you see all the airplanes that are up there right now. And that's the difference. Um, but I guess what I'm asking is, is, you know, the life mission, you talked about its ability to find planets, but also its ability to characterize planets. But that's two different jobs, ideally. Is there a version of life that finds a lot of planets that isn't trying to characterize them, but just find them? The tests equivalent compared to the characterizer, which would be more like, I don't know, aerial mm -hmm. as opposed to tests. I mean, one thing is, even if we just do, in, in, in quotation marks, just do the detection, we already have, you know, let's say 10 hours, 20 hours, 30 hours of observation on these targets. So we would already get some sort of, characterization of that planet itself. Just like a, if you do a transit observation, you find a planet, you already know the radius, right? So so it's always not like just detecting anything. You already get, for example, with, with uh, the live detection itself, you would already get a pretty decent uh, a decent grab on the temperature, on the radius of, of these planets. So so the detection itself already characterizes the, the planet a lot. And then it's, then it's probably going to be a bit of a flow chart of down-selecting the targets, right? You find... You find, let's say, in the detection phase, you, let's say, find 20 uh, interesting targets. Then you pick the, the ones with the right temperature. Then you observe all them. And then you pick the five that have, let's say, methane. And then you observe them even more to also find the oxygen. So something something like that, it's, it's probably. So there's, there's not really this, this clear distinction between detection and characterization because you already characterize a lot in its detection phase. And uh, as I mentioned before, it's, it's partly also for ourselves to demonstrate that we are in the worst case, if there's no other targets known, self-sufficient. Because as I mentioned in the very beginning, that was one, maybe one of the problems of, of the earlier missions like TPFI and, and uh, uh, Darwin, that they couldn't prove that they would get enough targets. So this is where we're coming from, this is detection and characterization phase. But in principle, if there's this magic mission appearing, finding all the... Uh, the plants in our neighborhood, we can start this characterization on day one. Yeah. And I guess I'm, I'm wondering, does, mm -hmm. you know, like if there's a, an unlimited budget, mm -hmm. is there a survey version of the life mission that finds them all? Because, you know, you say 10 hours, okay, fine. You know, we start at Proxima Centauri, we look at it for 10, 10 hours. Then we look at Alpha Centauri for 10 hours. Then we move on to, I don't know, Wolf 359. And we move on slowly through our list of, of star systems. Yeah, sure. At the end of the year, we've examined 10,000 stars. Um, there are, let's say, 60, 70,000 stars within 100 light years of us. There's a lot of targets. Um, but it would be great. Like if we could know all of them, that would be a game changer in astronomy. So I'm just wondering if this, if this, because I guess what, what I'm, I guess what I'm getting at is like it focuses on one star that you're having to block the light of that one star, but you can't say in a larger field of view, block multiple light from multiple stars. 
can you? I know we, we are we are doing a targeted service. We go right. to one star, observe for a certain amount of time that we calculated that it needs to 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 find the signal of an Earth, and if it's not there, we move to the next, and then we might return again to make sure that we were not just unlucky. But in principle, I don't think you need a very different architecture. You might need a different observing strategy. So you could, in principle, use live uh, and optimize it for completeness, optimize it for really just surveying and, and finding the target. So it's not necessarily a very different, uh, a very different architecture of, of, of an observatory. But um, right now, we are obviously um, um, optimizing to finding the most in the shortest amount of time that we can then follow up and find. But but this is also calculations we did. You know, what if we focus on habitable zone planets? We might find, a, you know, a few less Neptunes, but therefore find, you know, a handful more Earth-like planets. So this is trade-offs that we are making right now and, and that, that we can yeah. make with life. So it's not that, that the architecture is somewhat constraining us in that direction. Now, you're talking about characterizing, say, individual Earths. But do you get a snapshot of all of the planets that are in the system or you or do you have to change things to then look for the Jupiters or could you see them all moving in that grid around the star? Mm -hmm. No, right. Right now we would, I mean, to a certain you know, outer and inner working angle, of course, similar to 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 these uh, uh, choreographic missions. But in principle, we would see we would see all the planets that are you know, bright enough to, to send signals. And then it's actually one of the problems for us to, in the worst case, to disentangle them, right? So it's, it's a bit similar to, to radio velocity observations. If you get the radio velocity signal of seven planets, like seven sinusoidals on top of each other, then it's probably going to be a game of how can you disentangle these, you know, seven interferograms that are uh, uh, overlaying uh, on top of each other. But we, we would get we would get all planets in the system at the same time or all detectable planets in right. the system at the same time. Because, yeah. I mean, this is such a big question for planetary scientists, exoplanetary scientists right now, which is just what does a normal planetary system look like? They're, they're starting to get a sense that you don't find a lot of planets the size of Neptune, right? But that's like, these are these hints because they're just we all we see are the hot Jupiters and the planets around M door. So we just don't see the, the larger statistical truth about what planets exist. And that's it. And you know, what? like back to that original aspect. Yeah, okay, fine. We characterize a, a planetary system every 10 hours, we get through 10,000 in a year, we actually do get to all of the stars within a five year mission within uh, 100 light years of Earth. That's that's pretty great, actually. So I'm I'm sold. I say I say launch it as a uh, a survey mission first. But anyway, um, uh, well, so and we talked about the characterization. Now you talked about various gases, you know, methane, carbon dioxide, uh, maybe phosphine. What about techno signatures? What about say chlorofluorocarbons, things like that? Yeah, we are actually working on this right now. So together with Ravi Kopo Rapu and, and Jakob Pak Misra that many might know from this area. So we are, Eddie Schwitermann too, we are simulating this. So we have, for example, one scenario. And this is where it's actually very interesting to use life in that sense is we have the scenario where you have a civilization at the outer edge of the habitable zone and they somehow want to heat up their planet. And what you automatically do is you add additional absorbers in the mid infrared because that makes, you know, that, that causes an artificial greenhouse effect and makes your planet warmer. And, uh, this is by definition best observable in the mid infrared, right? If you add additional absorbers in the mid infrared, then it's, uh, then it's best observable in the mid infrared. And since these absorbers are uh, so designed that they absorb a lot, they are actually giving even stronger signals than usual biosignatures. So this is what we get. I don't want to spoil the paper, so people should wait until we publish it. But in, in principle, because they are designed to observe, uh, absorb a lot, they even have an even deeper imprint than just random in quotation marks, oxygen or methane or something, because that's their oh, job. That's really interesting. The job of the techno signature molecules is to absorb a lot in the mid infrared. And this is why it's so easy for us to observe it, right? Oh, yeah. I never thought about it like that. That's really yeah. interesting that, mm -hmm. that because chlorofluorocarbons are such a good absorber of heat, they are the perfect molecule to look for in infrared. And also the best example that there is a technological civilization in operation on that world because you don't get them in nature. Yeah. And we don't even have to, you know, have a targeted mission for it, right? We, we just get it for free. If we look at a planet at the outer edge of the habitable zone, 
you know, we don't even look for techno signatures by design of our observation, but we would get this information if it's there too. So it, it doesn't cost us any extra to look for techno signatures. Um, I mean, the in the field of astrobiology, coming up with a definitive biosignature has been tricky. And I think if you talk to 10 astrobiologists about what would be a definitive biosignature, right now, most of them would say, we don't have one. Or they, or if they did, they would disagree with each other. Um, based on your work so far, do you think that there is a, a good biosignature? Or is it combinations? What's the best way to go about this? So, so if you talk to a philosopher of science, they would uh, say there's never going to be a thing like that. Right? So there's, there's papers that people, people uh, say you can never exclude all the abiotic sources. Right, so there's there can always be some weird abiotic process that non no human uh, astrobiologist ever thought about that could also produce oxygen and methane. I think I mean I'm not a philosopher, but I think you know I think there's never going to be a logical way to exclude all of them. Right, so this is this is how you can always kill them. But I think coming back to these uh, techno signatures, there is really I mean that the, they are probably very unambiguous. Right, so I mean there's there's no natural way to produce CFCs and so I, again, we don't know it, but I think uh, they are, they are probably the most uh, uh, the most unambiguous uh, uh, biosignatures, and this is what makes techno signatures so interesting. But I think there's also a, a couple of you know sometimes called capstone biosignatures that are really strong on their own, where, where you need to you know invoke a lot of various chemical shady pathways to still produce that stuff. So, uh, but this is definitely one one big. Uh, uh, one big work for the astrobiology community because you really, especially if you want to start doing statistics, right? If you want to say how many or which fraction of habitable planets actually do have life, you can only do that if you're 95, 100% sure for each single observation, right? As soon as you're only 80% sure, then the whole fraction is limited by the 20% that you don't know, right? So, so if you, again, instead of just, you know, looking for our neighborhood, but really get to these you know the next uh, elements in the in the in the Drake equation, right? If you really want to derive them, you really need to know for every single observation if you found what you're looking for or not. And I think this is, on the theoretical side, probably the best, the biggest challenge that we will have in the next ten, fifteen years until these missions come up. Yeah, yeah. Oh, now, one other possibility that's been proposed is being able to see the infrared effect of vegetation, the mm -hmm. red edge. Mm -hmm. Do you think that will be detectable? Uh, so, unfortunately, not with life. So, that is a much shorter wavelength. So, this is in, right between the optical and the near infrared. So, we start at four or five micron, maybe, depending on our, our setup. So, there's there's not really a vegetation edge, but there's work uh, from folks from our community again that that, for example, look at Earth's reflectance spectra and see what what can we what can we learn from from Earth. What is the reflectance of an ocean versus the reflectance of a desert versus the reflectance or the, the emission in the mid infrared in in these different areas? But a real uh, red edge in the sense as we have it in the near infrared, we won't have. At least so far, uh, uh, something like this in the in the uh, mid infrared. Mm, okay, all right. So let's talk about like practical timelines. Then, what is the current status of your proposal? So this is a, a bit tricky to explain. So in in Europe, we have something similar to the decadal survey in the US, but it's not as politically binding, let's say, as a decadal. So once every 10, 15 years, uh, the ESA, uh, ESA asks the community for white papers. So, so that part is very similar. Uh, this, this last one was called Voyage 2050. So the missions for the 2040s, 2050s. And then a senior committee selects topics. So they're not necessarily selecting missions, but they select topics that they think are interesting for the next four or five slots of large mission, which is the equivalent of the flagships at NASA and, and ESA. And one of the topics that was recommended by the senior uh, committee was to get mid-infrared spectra of um, of, of terrestrial temperate exoplanets. That would be a great breakthrough and also in the history of European uh, 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 detections in the, and characterizations in this field would be a milestone for ESA. So that was one of the topics recommended. And LIFE, as we discussed, is 
a potential mission to, to solve this problem to get us to these uh, mid infrared spectra. And these slots are somewhere in the 2040s. So in the 2040s, if, you know, the, the, the process goes on and life might one day be selected for a study and then even selected for this slot, then we are probably talking about the 2040s. So I'm always saying it should be launched before I get retired. So, right. so that's, a, that's in 20 years. So I want to, you know, probably retire on the day when we launch it. So that, that's, that's my goal. About it. Yeah. I mean, I think about the people working on, say, the Lisa mission. And I mean, we've been hearing about the Lisa mission for decades. And still, we're probably not going to see it launch until 2035. And when we saw the, the precursor go, and they've tested out some of the technology, but still. Um, it's a, it's a long road to go from concept to flying. Yeah. I always compare it. So I'm from Cologne, Germany originally, and we have this big cathedral, cathedral in Cologne, right? And I always compare it a bit with building a cathedral, right? There were people who started building it 500 years ago who knew that they won't see the finished product at some point, right? And maybe if you want to answer this big question for humankind, you might just start building the cathedral and not see it finished in the end, but then still know you did your contribution to answering this big question. Right? This is this is how I motivate myself to still stay engaged for the next 20 years in this field. Yeah. But are there advances that are coming up or discoveries made by other telescopes that are changing your perspective mm -hmm. on this mission? I think one of the most important that we are still kind of waiting for is really if M star planets have atmospheres. So this big question that we want to hopefully be able to answer with the TRAPPIST system, we have a couple of transit spectra so far from the innermost ones, which doesn't don't seem to have very strong atmospheres, but we still uh, didn't have a call on the habitable zone, the somewhat farther out plane. So this is probably the on the scientific side, one of the most important questions for us in the live team that hopefully will be answered in the next couple of years, because as I mentioned before, this is a big target chunk of potential targets for us and also one of this unique or part of this unique parameter space where only life can really do science. So this is probably one of the major questions in, in uh, observational astronomy and then this whole uh, discussion about what makes a good biosignature and whatnot is probably on the more theoretical side what what drives us the most at the moment and what's the most crucial for us to make the mission a success. So. I mean, somewhere out there, an astronomer working with Webb knows whether or not there's an atmosphere at Trappist D and E and F. They have the data. They just haven't processed it and mm -hmm. released it yet. But we know B and C are airless. Mm -hmm. Well, there's still calls to make, right? <laughs> I mean, exoplanets are tricky, right? It could be, could be clouds or so. Uh, and it would be, it would be really sad, right? But we will see. I mean, for the, for the closer in ones, I can understand it. They are really bombarded by the host star. It's really, they're quite hot and stuff like this. But if you go farther out, eventually they should have some sort of atmosphere. So that's I go back they, and forth. Yeah. I'm like, oh yeah, it's awful. Like red, red dwarfs are just terrible there. They, their flares are devastating. There's no yeah. way a planet could hold on to its atmosphere in that kind of environment. And then on the other hand, I'm like, but what if it has a magnetosphere? And what if it's, you know, not as bad as we think? It's also a large group of stars. So, so like a very late, like an M9 is a very different beast than an M0, right? So, so it, it might be really crazy at this ultra cool, you know, guys like Trappist. But if you go to an M4, M3, it might get, you know, a bit easier. But we will see. I mean, this is really an exciting question. And at least, you know, a little glimpse at these atmosphere we'll hopefully get uh, in the future. And that's more, maybe the most exciting for, for, for me, at least, uh, that we will get from James Webb, hopefully. So what are you obsessed with right now? I mean, as we talked about, I'm really obsessed with, you know, being part of the team, part of the community that has the chance to find life eventually. So this is really, I think, uh, uh, the biggest, one of the biggest chances for our generation. Right? We are the first generation in history that, that has the chance to, to, as a shot or the technology at least, to be able to answer this, you know, millennia old question. But at the same time, also, you know, we we still are living on the only habitable and inhabited planet that we know. So I think uh, we should never uh, forget that there's uh, also problems on, on this planet to solve. And they are partly connected, right? We study atmospheres, we study climates. So, so it's not 
It's not happened in, in a vacuum. So I think this are, you know, we have this opportunity in our generation to really look that far out, but we also have the obligation or the challenge in our generation to look down and, and see that we keep our planet habitable and inhabited, right? So, so that keeps me awake sometimes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. It is the, I mean, I always say Earth is the best planet in the universe for us. For sure, for sure. Right. And we know that. And, mm -hmm. and no matter what happens, no matter what we find, we will never find a planet that we were lucky enough to be born on that is as good for, for what we need. And so we will be sightseers of the rest of the universe. And maybe one day we'll be visitors, but we will always be tourists and this will always be home. And, yeah, exactly. And, and even even if there are many tourist destinations, right, you still keep your ho house clean, right? I mean, it's so yeah. obvious. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, Daniel, it was a pleasure to talk to you. And I really look forward to this whole process moving forward. If people are interested in the life mission, and they want to sort of keep track of the status of it, what's the best place to do that? Uh, maybe just go to our uh, website, Life Space Mission. Uh, we have a really nice video. Uh, on the on the starting page that explains uh, life and then they can sign up for our newsletter uh, we have a we have a twitter account so uh, there you can follow us and yeah just stay in the loop especially early career uh, scientists if you're watching you know you are probably going to be the ones who, who get the data eventually so uh, get involved yeah yeah and if you're a member of the european space agency steering committee yeah choose Choose us. Mission. Or if you're a billionaire yeah. that wants to find us, you know, send us a right. check. <laughs> Sounds good. Yeah. All right. Well, Daniel, it was a pleasure to talk to you and good luck with the mission. I can't wait to learn about the uh, the first habitable exoplanets around other star systems. Thanks, Fraser. It was a pleasure. Now I'm going to talk about my thoughts on this interview that I just did, as well as some other interviews that I've done fairly recently that you should enjoy. But first, I'd like to thank our patrons. Thanks to David Richards, Mark Anstis, Joel Yancey, Antonio Lofilara, Dustin Cable, Vlad Shiplin, Modso, George, David Giltanen, Andrew M. Gross, Jeremy Mattern, Josh Schultz, and Jordan Young, who support us at the Master of the Universe level, and all of our supporters on Patreon. Thanks for all your support. So you see a few themes that I keep coming back to. Interferometry, the ability to combine the light of multiple space telescopes at the same time, where it's not about the combined light falling on the detectors. It's about the distance between those telescopes, giving you a large baseline and a coronagraph. But in this case, it's a different technique where you use the separation of the telescopes to null the light from the star. And that gives you the ability to reveal much fainter objects. It's a completely different way from blocking the light and yet theoretically should be very effective, but it needs to be tested in space, which it hasn't. And finally, being able to directly image Earth-sized worlds. You know, we talk about how the transit method, really, you've got to have this perfect scenario where you've got the, the star, the planet, and the planet has to pass right in front of the star. Like, what are the chances? Like, less than 1%. The radio velocity method, which can detect the movement of the star, very small percent chance that you're going to get things line up nicely so that you can actually detect the planet moving back and forth. But with direct imaging, you can see the planets around the star in all angles. And that is going to be the way that's going to take our understanding of the cosmos of all of the planets in our environment to the next level. So this mission hopefully could do both of those things, find the planets and find the Earth's and recognize what's in their atmospheres. I'm really excited about it. Now, obviously, I have done a ton of interviews about both exoplanets, interferometers, space telescopes, two fairly recent ones that I think you'll enjoy. I talked to Dr. Jesse Christensen about her new podcast. She is the holder of the vault of the exoplanets. And we talk about all of the really interesting exoplanets that have been found so far. And then I have this really wonderful interview about how we could use JWST to optimize its time to analyze the planets that we know of already. So two interesting interviews that you should definitely take a look at. I'll see you next time.